Felix might be a little bit redundant, but <laughs> we're going to start with Lisa, and we're going to ask, one of, what are the most difficult aspects of conducting an investigation with a pro sports organization, and for everybody else with collegiate um, organizations as well? And then what's something that the everyday sports fan would be surprised to hear? Okay. Well, the first question's really easy. Um, the, the biggest difficulty is just what I said to you. I have no subpoena power. Um, I can only ask and, and try to talk somebody into cooperating and explain to them why um, this is a worthwhile thing to do. So that's easy. What would you be most surprised about? I think you'd be most surprised about the small number of, especially players, that I have to investigate over a year. Because the, the media, if you just watch the media and you see something all the time, you start to feel like, you know, some great majority of our players are out engaging in this awful behavior when the real story is that it's a very small group of players. We have over 2,000 players that come through the league in a year. Um, and the overwhelming majority of them are not just law-abiding and good people and good husbands and good boyfriends and things like that. They're amazing people. I, I just I heard an article or read an article this morning about one of our players, um, he plays for the Texans. First year player, took his first paycheck, split it into three, and gave it to three cafeteria workers in the cafeteria at the Texans who had lost their homes in the hurricane. I can't tell you how many stories I see like that all the time, but that's not, I guess, selling the media and the hits on, on the media, and so I think that's the biggest surprise. And look, a few are too many. There's no question about it. I wouldn't have a job if we thought that, you know, ah, it's only a couple, so we don't have to do anything about it. But it really is a very small number. Um, in terms of what's uh, another thing that's difficult, I think that in the athletics context, there's a set of relationships that people have that are different from what you might find in other contexts of an institution. In my work, I work with universities and school systems, K-12 even, and um, there's often something special about the athletics context where, for example, um, the relationship between a coach and athletes is, is deep, it's intense. The building of trust between a coach and athletes is one of the critical things a coach does. But then in the Title IX investigation context, the coach may be one of the key uh, witnesses, a person who has critical information, um, maybe the person has to come forward. And that really comes into profound conflict sometimes with uh, what the coach has been trying to do and build with his or her team over, over you know, the person's whole career with that team. So, so that, I think that that's one challenge. Um, you know, there are plenty of surprises. I would say one thing is, is that sometimes the reality of these standards and the seriousness with which they're taken is a surprise for the people who get caught up in it. Um, what to them might have seemed a private moment, something intimate, something very much apart from the um, uh, sort of exposure, the, the glare of um, you know, observation by others, observation by their institution, apart from the rules, suddenly becomes actually something that is going to be very minutely taken apart and analyzed and, um, and, and evaluated based on a set of standards that uh, they may not have been thinking about when they were in that moment. I think for us, we, um, the same thing that Lisa said, we struggle with the lack of subpoena power. Um, it's something that anytime you do deal with NCAA investigations, whether it's on campus, through enforcement, or any other avenue, um, the lack of subpoena power definitely uh, hinders us in a lot of ways for any entity that's outside of collegiate athletics. We under our bylaws have rules that you have to cooperate with investigations with NCAA. If you are part, if you're employed in a member institution, you have an obligation. If you choose not to, you can get an ethical conduct violation. You can potentially get a show cause order and not work in the field for a while. But as an institution, we don't have that power. So when we're doing investigations, we don't have that authority at times. You may have it over employees, but outside entities, when you're doing your investigations, it's very difficult, even for the NCAA. So we struggle with that same issue. And having people preserve electronic evidence is also something that we struggle with. We implore them to do the same thing. So this is the NCAA, because we warn them that that could come back and haunt you as well. So that's something we struggle with. Um, the thing that would probably surprise most people the most, and it did for me when I got into this field, is 
how many rules there are and how nuanced there are. Um, it's a thick manual that you would not guess has an impact day to day and how much involvement we have with our coaches and how much they actually know and how good they are and how many how easy it is to break some of these rules. It's it's to me it was actually surprising at how many rules we have. So um, you hear about the big ones all the time, but you don't hear about the small ones that were broken or what they're trying to do to kind of remedy that. Sometimes you hear now other issues about this sport reported 26 violations or this school did that. You hear more, because of more FOIA requests, you hear about these more, but there are a lot of schools out there that just have little violations that they're all doing a good job, but you just kind of hear about the big issues as it's evidenced recently with the basketball issue. John, could you elaborate on some of the intricacies of Title IX? <laughs> <laughs> What time are we having lunch? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Don't get hungry. Um, yes, yeah, so um, before I was in the general counsel's office at the Department of Education, I was in the Office for Civil Rights and actually spent a lot of time both developing the policy guidance and then doing some enforcement work um, with Title IX as well as the other civil rights areas. Um, th there are a lot of intricacies. You know, one of the interesting areas that, again, may be surprising to people who get caught up in it is the obligation that, and I'm, I'm talking at the collegiate level, that um, an institution has to investigate and take action with regard to incidents that occurred off campus. Um, there's a lot less sort of privacy, uh, in a sense, than people might expect and then might have existed in, before, say, 2001, when, when the guidance came out and said that when an incident occurs off campus, if it is creating a hostile environment on campus, then the institution has to investigate it, determine what happened, and deal with it. Because the institution's obligation is to deliver education without discrimination on the basis of sex. And I'm going to back up for a second because I, I think that sometimes we lose track of where all these Title IX rules come from. Title IX is a law that says if you take money from the federal government, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And Title IX came after Title VI, which you may be familiar with, but but that was in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when the government first, I think, ventured into this kind of legislation and said, if you take money from the federal government, you won't discriminate on the basis of race. So Title IX came in 1972 and effectively took a very similar step with regard to sex in the educational context. So that rule then leads to uh, a concept that if individuals are engaging at a person-to-person -person level in sexually discriminatory behavior, which would include sexual harassment, to a degree that it is preventing a student from accessing the educational program, and that's what a hostile environment is, when it's so severe and pervasive that it has that effect, then the institution has an obligation to take action. And that's the obligation's Title IX uh, rule. Title IX, as a law, doesn't define the, you know, the uh, it doesn't control the behaviors of individuals. Individuals don't violate Title IX in the sense that uh, Title IX, you know, you can't go to, you can't as an individual be, you know, arrested for violating Title IX, for example. But your institution can be held responsible for not addressing if there's sex discrimination going on on campus in a way that means that it is failing to deliver its on its obligation to provide education without discrimination. So um, th that's the framework in which the obligations of institutions have developed and been articulated about why an institution needs to be vigilant and needs to be responsive when there's sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, sexual violence on campus or sometimes even off campus. Cool. And then, uh, Jason, for you, um, how do universities handle internal investigations and could you elaborate on the university interaction with local law enforcement? Yeah, so each, in each institution kind of handles it differently. I'll kind of give you a couple examples. Um, you may have seen that we here at Virginia had a kind of major violation that occurred with uh, taking photographs. It was in the news. It was basically our coaches had some co off-campus contact when it was impermissible. So we got notified by notified about it from our head coach, and so our head coach brought it to our attention. And so we kind of we we did what kind of Lisa said. We kind of collect all the evidence as possible, and then we start piecing together what the story, what happened. So we collected all the evidence. We talked to all the coaches. We sat down with them and said, said "Please talk to us about tell us what happened." We talked about the talk to the prospects, asked them what happened, and in that situation, we were actually working with the NCAA enforcement to try to get them 
uh, to kind of the case to go through summary disposition so we'd have to go through the committee infractions. Essentially, it's kind of like summary judgment if you're in court. It's a very similar idea. So we're working with them to kind of already say, hey, this is what we, we already, we're investigating this. We need your help to investigate this as well, too. We're going to do it. So we invest, we talked to all the coaches. They talked to all the coaches. They talked to the prospects. We then kind of drafted a report, almost like a memo, saying this is what happened, this story. And th then between the parties, we agreed to the facts. And then it went to the committee just to kind of rule on it. That was a relatively quick process. That was about a seven to eight month process. Eight month process. When I was at Southern, I was part of the team that kind of was collected evidence that they had a, a very major, major level one in violation. And I was investigating one aspect of it. And so I would go and talk to all the coaches, players, same thing. And I was working with NCAA enforcement on that one as well too. And you, we walk a very fine line. We're supposed to be essentially the arm of, arm of enforcement protecting the institution to maintain institutional control. But you also then have to advise them about rules and everything else as well too. So we walk this really fine line every day because if you are too tough on them in the investigations, you may not be able to help them later on. So sometimes that's why you need outside counsel. Sometimes that's why and NCAA is also good to deal with. Almost on the day-to-day -day basis, we deal with investigating issues here and there, whether it comes up from our coaches, anonymous tips, and we just have to, we go straight to the source and then we collect all the evidence and talk to them about the issue and then try to figure out, did they violate the rules? Sometimes we then talk to the ACC, get their input. Sometimes we talk to the NCAA, but it's really mapping out just like a case. Um, we haven't worked with law enforcement too much. Um, each institution is different. Um, the best example would be now what happened with the basketball situation that we didn't, none of us are working with law enforcement, but once that complaint came out, most of us read that complaint. And whether you read the media reports or complaint, you try to figure out, okay, were any of our coaches involved? Okay, maybe not. Were any of our universities, uh, you know, one of the anonymous universities? Maybe not. But now we're going to investigate, talk to our coaches as well and say, hey, do you know about any of these situations? Is this something we're going to have to worry about? I believe that's what each institution is trying to figure out right now, if that issue is a pervasive issue at their institution or if it's just other elsewhere. But that's kind of how we work with law enforcement. And that's kind of what we do with the investigation. Each one is different. Again, it's a case by case, but sometimes you just, it's availability of information and sometimes we can't get as much as we want. We just, we try to use the NCAA or our other sources to get as much as possible. And just so everybody can be on the same page, are there different behaviors or regulations that are imposed on athletes as opposed to members of the general student body? Yeah, yeah, there definitely are. Um, our rules definitely have um, provide certain limits for them. So basically, they cannot receive extra benefits. Extra benefits is anything that is not available to the student body. But at the same time, there are other scholarship student athletes who could maybe accept a gift from a booster, accepts additional monies from somebody else, an outside source. But our student athletes are held to the standards that they can't get extra benefits. So they get awarded their scholarship based on the cost of attendance. So that's the number that's factored that what it costs to attend an undergrad here at University of Virginia. Their scholarship cannot go above that unless they have Pell eligibility in a, a program that has financial need. So if it goes beyond that and beyond what's permitted under the rules, whether it's meals, whether it's occasional meals, whether it's equipment, gear or other specialty travel stuff, they can't get anything above and beyond that. That would be a violation. For example, in the, the recent case when they were talking about the parents um, of some of these basketball players getting $5,000, $8,000, dollars $1,800, various amounts to talk to these advisors, those are benefits above and beyond what is permissible under our rules. Whereas any of you guys, if someone is recruiting you, could give you guys those bonuses or, or those incentives. So those, the student athletes are definitely held to a higher standard with our rules so they could be eligible for intercollegiate athletics. Cool. Um, and John, could you give us uh, what your role kind of is in terms of how you make sure that people are complying with um, certain rules and regulations when you were with the Department of Education? Sure, yeah. Um, so right, I've, I've done that from a number of different perspectives. Uh, my original role was uh, a very general one, chief of staff to the assistant secretary for civil rights. But I, I can answer a little more specifically in my next role when I was deputy assistant secretary for policy. Um, that was that's the role that has the team that produces the somewhat infamous guidance, the De dear colleague letters. Uh, so these were letters that were particularly being produced particularly rapidly um, during the Obama administration, although they, they've been done by OCR since time immemorial um, and are still being done. Um, 
sub-regulatory guidance. So we've got our law, we've got our promulgated regulations, and then an agency can um, issue guidance to explain how it interprets the regulations, what the regulations mean. And there are different ways to legally understand what that guidance is. Typically, um, the, the, I think the understanding would be that you can't make new rules for people, but you can clarify things that are already in the rules. To make new rules, you have to go through notice and comment, the procedures required under the Administrative Procedures Act. There is another way to understand, particularly the OCR guidance, which is that OCR is a law enforcement agency, and I think it reasonably can, can say to the world, what we're doing in this guidance is telling you how we're going to enforce the law. No, there's not a regulation that says it means this or that this is, um, this is what the law means, but we're giving you warning that when we go to enforce it, this is our understanding of it, and you can challenge us in court on that. We're letting you know what our position is going to be. The tricky thing with OCR is that nobody ever challenges OCR because to do so puts all of your federal funding at risk. So um, there really was a generation of a lot of guidance that went pretty deep into specific things that schools were being held accountable for, um, which have never been tested in court. Um, but that was, that was my role there to lead the team that generated guidance on Title IX, but also race discrimination, disability discrimination, um, conceivably age discrimination, although we never did any of that when I was there. Later, as I mentioned, I was in an enforcement capacity. I was acting chief attorney for a regional office that actually included Virginia. Um, and, and so that was working with a team of investigators who would take complaints from students at schools, other people, and go to investigate alleged violations of the civil rights laws at the schools. And, and one thing that I was very deeply involved in was resolving a series of complaints that had been issued at Virginia Military Institute, not so far from here, um, regarding Title IX violations. But again, we were doing the gamut there. My work now is to, from a private counsel perspective, work with institutions to help them comply. So it's, it's a little bit on the other side. Um, I don't litigate on behalf of institutions. I don't defend them when they're sued under Title IX. But what I do is go in to work very intensively with people in an institution to understand where their policies may need to be reformed, to work with them in creating new policies, to develop the capacities to satisfy Title IX requirements, which may be building an in-house capacity to investigate. Um, it, it, it may well be you know, thinking about culture change and what it's going to take to create a different kind of environment at institutions. Um, and, and what are all the things that are going to be necessary to, A, create an environment where sexual harassment and misconduct occur a lot less, and B, to deal with it adequately when it occurs. Um, thanks. That's, that's a great answer. Um, but this next question is directed towards Lisa, but anybody can answer. Um, how are domestic violence investigations different when someone's in the public eye? Um, so student athletes, they would still be somewhat celebrities on campus sometimes, or at least within the public eye. And then, just go from there. I can say from the point of view of the investigator, it, it shouldn't have any effect uh, on how you make your decision or you do your investigation. You should do the same thorough investigation and analyze the evidence you get exactly the same, whether it's a star athlete. Um, or, or it's not, I always say in our job, whether it's your starting player or it's your third string kicker. Um, it, it should be exactly the same, but the practicality, not, not on me, although there's pressure, and if you read the news, you read some of the pressure um, I've been under, uh, but I, I think more importantly, it affects the cooperation that we get from other people who are asking to voluntarily cooperate. I ju it just, Imagine for a moment, if you will, if you were uh, an alleged victim of somebody who, if you reported it, your incident, even if they didn't print your name, but the incident about what happened is all over the media, and I mean the national media. So a little story, when I took the job, uh, I accepted the job from Commissioner Goodell and went in, shook his hand, and, and he said to me, you better develop a really thick skin. And I thought to myself, well, I have a thick skin. I've been chief of sex crimes in the Manhattan DA's office for the last 10 years in the media capital of the world. How bad could this be? 
Much, much, <laughs> much worse. I mean, national, if not international, you know, media attention like you've never seen, talking heads who have to fill 24-7 on shows and radio and blogs and whatever, and people with a little knowledge is a dangerous thing kind of thing. Um, look, I'm a professional. They pay me to, as the commissioner said, develop a tough skin. You took the job. But think what this is like for an alleged victim or witnesses, their family members, and frankly on the other side too, the alleged perpetrator, and their friends and their family members and everybody trying to be, who is now involved in an investigation that is not going to be private, that's going to be all over. Here at a university, it will be different if it's a top athlete here who's under investigation. The word will get out and all around, and even if the paper doesn't print the alleged victim's names, everybody on campus will know who it is. That's reality, and that poses, uh, you know, a real issue for uh, handling these kind of investigations. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I think that we see now is what Lisa talked about—the reality changing is things getting out there, whether it's via social media or the media. For example, when Joe Mixon had his incident, and that was in the media, and prior to situations. Previously, maybe a student may have only been disciplined or may not have been kicked off the team, but I think you see a change in college athletics to where people are now actually being dismissed from the team, dismissed from the university, um, with the issue being a little bit more you know, nationwide and more sensitive in people, it, especially when video gets out or even otherwise, I think people are taking more corrective actions quicker, just period, than they did before. Cool. Jason, you talked a little bit about the NCAA um, scandal that's going on with the basketball like coaches and FBI. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and then also talk about self-imposed sanctions? Yeah, so right now with that coming out, I, I don't know if, if anybody's read the complaint, a lot of it has come down to <clears throat> various accounts of wire fraud or different, you know, essentially bribing an official, someone who works for a public institution takes more than $10,000 in federal funds. And a lot of them, there were four assistant coaches who were named. There were several other defendants, but four assistant coaches. And so all those schools at this point Prior to the point, I believe they probably did not know about this information. And so now they have to investigate this issue themselves. They are probably going to work with enforcement, most likely because they just found out about it as well, too. So they're going to try to figure out at what point what violations were had. So we talked about extra benefits before. So the kids who were receiving extra money, that's going to be an extra benefit. There are a couple kids, one at Louisville, one at Arizona, that said to have received money before they even entered. So as a prospect, so those were impermissible benefits that would affect your eligibility. And if you got money from an agent, which a, a, an advisor could be considered an agent, or a money manager could also be considered an agent, because NCAA has pretty loose definition of what an agent is. It could be anybody that markets your uh, athletic ability or tries to make money off your athletic ability, which all those people could probably fit under that category. And that definition was expanded after the Cam Newton um, situation. So that is probably now all those schools are trying to figure out, did any of our guys take money? Did anybody else take money? To what extent did our coaches give money to our current student athletes? Does anybody have to be reinstated? Did anybody actually participate while they were ineligible? And if that's the case, now we have to go back and figure that out, do an investigation. Now we have to uh, file a level one or level two self-report. And then you would say, okay, you would look at all the guidance the same way that we have precedent in any case or any state, and you would look at the cases, we have our own cases in the NCAA, or the NCAA has them in a database. We would look through that and say, okay, what was the previous discipline for that? And then you would propose what you think should be the discipline. You'd also say the mitigating factors as well, too, to maybe support what that discipline would be. And then that will, this will then go before the committee infractions. It can either go for a full hearing, which it may on some issues, by schools, or they may go through the summary disposition area where it's an agreed upon uh, discipline between enforcement and the school about what should go forward. This is very kind of unprecedented, so I'm not really sure what's gonna happen, but the issues with the players receiving the money, th there's a lot of precedent on that. So there probably will be various levels of violations coming out from these schools, but it's gonna be a long process because they don't have to investigate whether those were single incidences or whether they were, they were previous incidences, and they'll probably go back it, depending on their situation, how long the coach is there, and they'll go back. Um, and other schools will probably start talking to those coaches as well, too. Like one of the coaches was at Oklahoma State. Previously, he was at South Carolina. Well, now South Carolina, may they may not have been implicated too much, but they now have a due diligence to go back and look, see if there are any issues as well, too. So, guys, we're about at the 10-minute mark left. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Anybody have? How 
So from our perspective, it's all the same. Uh, the, the rules apply, what, apply to you the same, whether you're a public institution or a private institution. The only thing that sometimes is different is maybe whether certain things, um, the same thing as a public agency versus a public agent or private entity, whether you're held to different standards, that sometimes can uh, hinder investigation. But from a rules perspective, it's all the same. They're held, held to the same standard. What I would add is that, um, you know, there are a number of constitutional provisions that clearly apply in the public institution context, right? Freedom of speech, uh, due process clause um, are two that are relevant in Title IX context. OCR hasn't been, I think, fully clear on how those rights play into Title IX in, in the sense that, you know, you could make an argument that Title IX incorporates a freedom of speech component. Uh, the various ways you could do that. Um, and, and certainly now, the, and, and I, I want to emphasize prior to Betsy DeVos, the Department of Education was focusing a lot more on due process for respondents in Title IX cases. Um, and um, obviously now the Department of Education is speaking about that a lot too. So there's certainly the implication that it's a requirement under Title IX, even at a private institution, to afford due process, which makes sense given that the regulation says an institution has to have equitable grievance procedures and you know, due process could be considered a necessary element of being equitable. Uh, but I do think that there are questions around how those rights may apply in the private context that you know, are not as clearly answered as they are in the public context. more than a dichotomy that one of the most interesting things about working at the NFL it's unique to professional sports uh, organizations and, and I was surprised this so we have the commissioner right who one thinks if you're not in the business is the CEO right and everybody else answers to the commissioner well we've got 32 owners right who are the bosses they employ the commissioner so it's a it's an interesting uh, um, relationship they have all bought in um, to both the personal conduct policy, to the revised processes. They all had to vote. They voted 32 to 0 in December of 14 to adopt the processes to enforce um, our conduct uh, strictures better. Um, but when it comes to when you bring up somebody like Joe Mixon uh, and things like that, we've got 32 owners who get to make their decisions by, by the way the organization is as to who they draft for their teams. They're very different people, all those 32 owners. A lot of them, I will tell you, really believe in second chances. They really believe that, that people make mistakes and really bad mistakes and do really bad things, you know, younger. But we live in a, a world, our criminal justice system is such, we rarely throw the key away on the first thing that you do. We give you another chance. And a lot of our owners truly believe in that, especially because of the age at which you would be doing these things before you're eligible for the draft. Um, and that's part of the explanation. One of the things we've done at the league, uh, when someone has drafted someone like Joe Mixon, who had real issues in the past, Frank Clark, who's in Seattle, there are a couple other guys in the couple years I've been there that had some uh, really bad things they had done in their past, it is uh, work with that team to make sure that we give them uh, the person they drafted extra counseling, extra support. If you're going into this, you're giving somebody a second chance. Guess what, nobody um, just changes behavior, changes attitudes, 
on their own. It's very unusual, especially at that age. I raised three kids that age, two boys and a girl. Um, I still call, and, and Spence here grew up with my sons. I went to high school, and, uh, and Spence says, I still call my middle son my work in progress. Um, he's progressed well, he's 25 <laughs> now. Um, but, um, but, you know, the age group is such that you need to give them support and that's why part of our disciplinary system is counseling and programming and this. So if we're going to hire those kinds of guys, we say to our owners, if you're going to give those guys a second chance, you can't just say you got a second chance and leave them on their own. And I think they've been very good about that and putting, you know, programs and counseling. And some have gone to the extent of having almost like a big brother some former uh, player on the team who lives in that area and this is your mentor and, and your mentor is going to you know check in with you all the time all our teams have player engagement directors so almost all of them are former players not 100 percent but most of them whose job it is they work in the building it, it is to be looking out for people that may have more challenging uh you know it's more challenging for them to uh, maintain their behavior to the strictures that we have Anybody else? Um, Mr. Bill, as a former prosecutor, um, how would you describe the tension between uh, investigating something that is simultaneously being investigated by a law enforcement agency, and how would you describe the differences on the public and private sector side of investigating them and then recommending an outcome, whether it be to Mr. Morgenthau or to Mr. Riddell? Right. Um, so I, I, I think it's one of the reasons I think it makes sense for us to, to be doing our own investigation the way schools have to do their own investigations. We have different goals in mind. There are different things we're trying to remedy if something went wrong there. Um, and, and so I, I also think we have different evidentiary standards. So when I had to make a recommendation to Mr. Morgenthau about um, whether I thought a case should go ahead, it wasn't just a matter of whether I believed from my investigation it happened. I had to make the decision, did we have enough evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt in court? It's unethical for a prosecutor to bring a case if they don't believe, uh, yeah, here I'll use some non-legal term, they have a shot in hell of winning it in court. <laughs> um, that would be unethical. Now, I have to do the same thing with the commissioner, but I have a different standard of proof. So any, uh, I'm making a recommendation that we have enough evidence to survive an appeal hearing, and more probable than not, that we have sufficient credible evidence. Um, I think one of the things I said to people, he knew, the commissioner knew when he hired me, as did any um, school or other entity that ever hired my division at TNM um, Protection Resources that um, you're getting the truth about what happened, at least the best we know it. Look, I'm not infallible. You know, I'm not God, I'm not infallible, but you can bet that you are going to get with the 30 years of experience my unvarnished opinion about what I think really happened. It. You will then do with it what you think is appropriate, um, but that's what I think. To answer your last question, how do we work with law enforcement on that? I, I try to make sure the law enforcement agencies that, that we're dealing with don't feel like we're coming in after them and we're going to embarrass them or we're looking to embarrass them. I sit there and say, very clear, I have a different burden of proof than you do and I have different evidentiary laws. We can use hearsay um, in a workplace investigation and a workplace decision. You can't. You needed uh, Janae Palmer Rice to get on a witness stand and be cross-examined for you to go ahead with the case. We didn't. Um, so th that's how we're trying to, to work well with them and not make them feel like we're looking to show them up because we're not. I believe we have time for one more question. Anybody have one? Oh. Do you guys notice that individual coaches um, add any sort of expectations or rules upon their players and whether that makes any difference in terms of like cultural shifts? Oh, I think so. Hey, I was going to give the guys a chance to I go first. <laughs> they look at me, so I'm going to say it first. You can figure your answer. I, absolutely. Look, I, I think that um, things come from the top down, right? Whether it's, whether it's a team, whether it's a family, whether it's a business, people, you know, take on the atmosphere from the top down. I, it's, it's one of the reasons I took the job that I have. I can tell you Commissioner Goodell wants this to work. 
he really cares about this. Um, and if you don't have that, if the people down here go, you know, we're all trying to hide this stuff and, you know, I don't really care, then you're going to see a real difference. And we have teams that have more, you know, violations than other teams. And I think that somewhat comes not, I wouldn't just say from the coach, because it's, again, an interesting entity. You could have a, a head coach who is a certain way and other executives who are different. You know, there are many different people that can influence your team's, uh, you know, behavior and, and culture. But I do think it has an influence. I would agree. I think it's from our perspective in college athletics. It can be athletic director down. It could be coaches down. It could be, you know, different ways you look at it. And that's why the NCAA put in a rule a couple years ago about head coach responsibility. So no longer can you just the head coach just you know, play naive and say, oh, I don't know what was going on with here with the coaches. It was for that reason. So it has to be a top-down approach. The coach has to have some control. And it's a kind of a strict liability rule, too. So they can't just say, well, I didn't know about it anymore. Now you have to be involved. You have to be an active CEO of your kind of little company, your department. And so it definitely has an impact. Or at least if it didn't before, I think it's starting to. And that's what the purpose of that rule was. And I'll add about leadership. And this applies to coaches, athletic directors, university presidents that one of the changes in culture that's occurred is that there are certain values that are you know defined in title nine that are defined in expectations about um, domestic violence this set of laws around these issues that are absolute i think in a way that they might not have been before um, you know i think that there was a time when it would have been considered appropriate for a leader to do a real balancing test and you know some of the balancing might have been a little bit um, a little mercenary in the sense of, you know, this is a great player. We need the great player. I'm going to weigh that against how bad this was. Some of it might have been very humane. Like, you know, um, you know, I know that this is somebody who, you know, is here but hasn't had some of the, you know, training or background that we, we want the person to have. And this is the person's one chance for an education. And I really want to keep this person here at our school. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of factors might have come into play that at some points in, uh, in universities and, and maybe in the NFL would have made it seem appropriate to say, I'm going to treat this case a little differently from another case. Um, and I think that there's less room to appropriately balance a really wide range of factors in, in evaluating these situations now. And that's something that um, you know, leadership when it doesn't embrace it, I think that that's when there's some of the biggest crises and, and scandals. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out to the investigation and compliance panel here. Um, food is obviously ready, and we're in the back. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for being great. Panel. Sure.